Rise now, ye tarnished, ye dead who yet live. The call of long lost grace speaks to us all. I can't remember the last release that engrossed me as much as Elden Ring. I've been a fan of the Souls series for years. I was skeptical going in. Part of me thought Elden Ring might simply turn to Dark Souls 4 Open World Edition. Those fears were quickly put to rest. Elden Ring wonderfully integrates the open world format into the Souls formula. It avoids the pitfalls that most open world titles fall into. There's that sense of wonder and exploration that's only matched by a few titles I've played. There are moments in Elden Ring that are some of the best experiences I've had in years, maybe in all my time playing video games. It maintains a high bar of quality for a good portion of time. That said, it's not perfect, and the backstretch really makes those flaws apparent. There can always be too much of a good thing, and that's something that Elden Ring falls victim to. But overall, it's another outstanding title that FromSoft has put together and puts the work of so many others to shame. Before diving in, I'm putting a spoiler warning here now. For most of my videos, I keep them till the end, but just the way Elden Ring is structured, that's not going to be the case here. I played Elden Ring on PC with a playtime of around 80 hours. The game did have a fairly iffy start performance-wise for some. I was using a 1070. I did have some micro stutters at first in the open world while horseback, mostly went away after the first patch. Overall, my experience performance-wise was mostly fine, but I want to make note of it. I beat most of the game on the 1.02 patch. The last 10 hours or so was with 1.03. I will bring up some aspects here and there about the differences, but do note that depending on when you watch this, further aspects may have been changed. For example, a couple of Ashes of War getting heavily nerfed. I went as a confessor for my class. I did a few respecs throughout my playthrough to try out other weapons and spells instead of starting a new playthrough. Most of that was for video capturing purposes. Although I have to admit, picking up all those sorceries or weapons that were out of my reach intelligence-wise did lead to some respecs here. Although at the end of the day, I didn't use a ton of sorceries. I mostly stuck with two-handing a weapon with the Soul series, and with Elden Ring, it was the same case. So a bit about my experience with the Soulsborne series. I've played Dark Souls 1 through 3 and Demon Souls. The order I played them in was 1 through 3 and then Demon Souls. That was the original and not the remake. I would rank them from best to worst, Dark Souls 1, then Demon Souls, Dark Souls 3, and Dark Souls 2. I go back and forth between 2 and 3. 2 can be all over the place in quality, but has some high quality DLC. Dark Souls 3, while consistent, is a bit derivative, although it does have some of my favorite bosses in the series. I remember one review calling it Dark Souls Greatest Hits, which I think is the best way of describing Dark Souls 3. For Bloodborne, I've played a couple of hours or so, but I don't have a PS4. I have seen most of the boss fights. Still, maybe we'll see a Bloodborne PC port? Although for the last couple of years, that seems to have become the new Half-Life 3 one joke. That said, within three weeks, Elden Ring sold 12 million copies. 44% of it was on PC. Sony exclusives are starting to pop up on PC. People would buy Bloodborne on PC in a heartbeat if it was released, myself included. I haven't actually played Sekiro yet, although I do plan on taking a look at it later this year. When it comes to open world games, I don't play a ton of them. I didn't have a case of open world fatigue that I know some people went into Elden Ring with. I think the last ones I played were in the 2015 to 2016 timeframe with Metal Gear Solid 5 and The Witcher 3, along with a replay of Fallout New Vegas a couple of years back. I have to know I have been curious to check out Breath of the Wild for a while. Elden Ring certainly helped push that further up in the list. I do plan on visiting it for video at a later time. With that, let's start with the open world elements of Elden Ring. It's interesting to see a Japanese studio's take on open world. Compared to Western studios, the Japanese don't make a ton of open world titles. So, how is FromSoft's foray into the open world? After all, one of the reasons for the success of the Soulsborne titles have been just how much of their design philosophy flies in the face of conventional modern design trends in games. The same case happens here. There are a number of design choices in Elden Ring that fly in the face of conventional open world games. The ones that lead me to viewing these games as checklist simulators in which you could just shut off your brain and sleep through. Firstly, the fact that there's no mini-map or a million indicators cluttering our UI. One thing I don't think that gets enough attention in the decline of game quality over the last 15 years or so, give or take, is the reliance that games have placed on mini-maps, on objective icons, or indicators that fill up your screen with information. The kind in which you could just stare at where you need to go next instead of taking the world in and letting the 
world tell you where to go. I remember having this moment of revelation when playing Witcher 3, about 15 or so hours in. I'd just been mostly staring at the corner of the screen or objective indicators for a good portion of the time. I promptly turned them off and had a far better experience. When it comes to these, I've seen a number of people say, well, if you don't like it, just turn it off, which most games allow you to do so, or you could find mods to do so. In some cases, this does work. Witcher 3 was mostly playable without it. However, it became clear the moments where you need to use Witcher Sense that they were built with the mini-map in mind. And playing these games that fill your screen with objective indicators, compasses, mini-maps, they're designed around them. Sure, you could turn them off, but it becomes a frustrating affair. For example, Grand Theft Auto V. Playing the base game as is, turning off minimaps became a nightmare with missions. You have to go to very specific points to trigger events and missions. Ubisoft as well has a reputation over the years of filling their screen with clutter. Granted, they have made some adjustments to deal with it. For example, adding an exploration mode in some of the more recent Assassin's Creed titles. I haven't played these, so I can't really comment exactly on how it works, but I am glad to see that they did recognize this. All those conventional aspects of the open world are next to non-existent here. And this whole aspect has led to some interesting discussions around Elden Ring and open world titles. I'm happy to see that this topic of over-reliance on mini-maps and objective indicators has started to receive a lot more attention. I'm sure you've seen this picture someone drew up in regards to if Ubisoft made Elden Ring, which is pretty funny. And this footage that you're seeing here comes from the video title If Elden Ring Was Not Made by FromSoft. Over-exaggerated? Sure, but it does help to magnify the design decisions that a number of these open world titles take. Some developers from studios like EA, Guerrilla Games, and Ubisoft have made some tweets about the UI and quest design in Elden Ring and were dunked on. And hey, I can understand where they're coming from. They've been working in the open world space for years, thinking they have the best practices down pat. And along comes an open world game that flies in the face of what they made and what they've been taught. A game that's captured the hearts of millions. Of course, they're going to have a bit of a crisis of faith of what they worked on up to that point. Although so maybe they should have just journaled their thoughts instead of tweeting out for others to dunk on them or discuss it with their team. So at first I was a bit disappointed that you couldn't disable the compass in game. Well, you can do that with a mod here. However, it's so minimal that it just blends in after a while and will disappear at times. The map isn't filled with a bunch of question marks here for us to explore. Beyond a couple of moments, no one marks anything on our map. Of course, after a period of time looking at the map, you will recognize what certain images on it mean. That scribble there will be a church, or a fort, a never goal, or a tunnel. You can place a number of markers on your map. They have a number of distinct markers, which is very handy. Perhaps there's an area which is too difficult for you to come back to later. Or this area has a whirlwind jump or you're short sure a stone sword key. Prior to the first patch, I would also make markers to know where NPCs are, although they now show up on the map with the newer version. No quest objectives, no journal. Now, I've seen a number of people suggest that having something like a basic journal, perhaps something along the lines of Morrowind, would have been nice to have. And for a game as large and as long as Elden Ring, that is a fair point. I didn't have an issue, however, keeping pen and paper handy nearby to make notes of what various NPCs talk to me about. And of all the flaws I found in Elden Ring, and don't worry, we'll get to them, this wasn't one of them. This leads into the point of what I like to call convenience versus immersion. Lots of open world games have taken this convenience approach in regards to navigation. The mini-maps, quest markers telling you exactly where you need to go, Elden Ring does away with most of that. Of course, there are some convenience staples, such as fast travel. There are a few exceptions, such as being in combat or in locations like Tales or Catacombs, but otherwise you could fast travel to any Shrine of Grace that you have visited. There are plenty of shrines around, and one of my issues I had with Elden Ring is maybe there was a bit too many in the open world. And part of me does wonder if they tried something like the Silt Strider system in Morrowind for fast travel. That said, that kind of system would have to be something decided very on in development to make it work with the world. Now, putting in 80 plus hours gave me plenty of time to take the world in. But I'm sure if you asked me to draw out the map of Elden Ring, I could tell you where plenty of things were located in a general vicinity. Not just major landmarks, but tunnels, catacombs, caves, Evergoals. I'm sure you could as well. Now, compare that to a another open world title full of conveniences in regards to navigation. One in which you just need to follow the objective indicators. How much do you think you could recite if you had to draw the map? I'm sure it'd be a lot more difficult. There are other aspects of Elden Ring that are much more focused on being convenient compared to other open world games, where there they would focus on immersion. For example, crafting systems. Elden Ring has added a crafting system, a trademark of open world titles. However, to pick up materials here, it's just a button press. There's no animation, no need to get off your horse. You need to select it to pick it up, skin it, listen to your character make a comment about it. Other titles like to make this aspect more immersive. It's the wrong trade-off. Elden Ring does the opposite. It focuses on the bigger picture with its exploration, and the smaller details, it makes a quick process. Now, it might seem like I'm making this a bigger deal than it actually is, but I think for many, Elden Ring has been a real eye-opener in regards to just how satisfying exploration can be when you strip away so many of these conventions and conveniences that open-world titles love to make use of, and what a world Elden Ring is to take in an explore. 
explore. Lands Between always has something new for us to find. Sure, there is the critical path of hitting the legacy dungeons and key locations, but there's so much more here. We'll come across caves, catacombs, tunnels to scour through, runes, camps, forts, manors, evergolds, teleporters, and even a few teleporter traps to take us to parts unknown. NPCs for quests, merchants through the land for supplies, cookbooks, and hints. These Shadow of the Colossus-like creatures for remembrances. And speaking of Shadow of the Colossus, few games have hit that wonder of exploration like it. Elden Ring is one of those titles. Your Earth tree is always there, beckoning us, but there's plenty of minor earth trees as well along the way for us to check out. While the Soulsborne series has always had great art direction, FromSoft has really outdone themselves with Elden Ring. There's plenty of variety amongst these landscapes. Some are more welcoming, some not so much. There were a number of times throughout my playthrough that I just stop, take a look around, to take the world in. Now, before playing Elden Ring, my main concern was if they were going to mesh that sense of exploration of past titles with the open world format. There was one moment in particular early on where it really sealed the deal I was playing something special. I know others who experience this moment tend to agree. Exploring one of the ruins just southeast of where you merge in Limgrave, there is a chest. Of course, at this point in the game, I'm still swinging at chests, wondering if they're going to use mimics. Well, this chest wasn't a mimic, but it did warp me away. Really really far away out east. I'm way out of my element here. I have no idea where I am. Lingrave was like heaven compared to this. Plus, these enemies are way above me level-wise at this point, which did make it very satisfying to return later on to make my way through these areas with much greater ease. And after some time wandering through the swamps aimlessly, I find a Shrine of Grace, and now I have access to the Round Table Hold. It's there that things really open up. A whole bunch of NPCs, smithing, a whole info dump courtesy of Gideon. Sorry, let's try that again. And Sir Gideon of the all-knowing! Plus, there's also the hugs with Fia. This is where I really fell in love with the game. I knew that FromSoft had done it again. Now, if they could just keep it up for the rest of the game. And they did to an extent, but more on that later. Another notable exploration moment would be descending that elevator into the underground sections for the first time. Like, how large is this game? There's an underground section? And the crazy thing is, in regards to the critical path, unless I'm mistaken, you don't need to go to the underground section at all. In fact, there's a good portion of the game that's optional. Of course, this makes the game much more challenging, as these areas offer tons of loot and experience to gain. It's still possible to bypass a significant portion of the game. However, the lands between have such enticing places to visit, you won't want to be doing so. Just when you think you've seen it all, you come across something new, like stumbling across a windmill village full of dancing women. The last game that I think hit that itch of wonder of exploration would, well, would have to be the first time playing Dark Souls. Here they took that sense of wonder and exploration that the series has been known for and made it work in an open world format. It didn't feel bolted on, but a natural evolution. Now with these large lands, it would be tough if we had to go on foot the entire time. Luckily, we have a steed on hand. It will summon a spectral steed named Torrent. Torrent has chosen you. Torrent is our horse to help us travel through the lands between. He warps in right under us and controls extremely well. I don't think there was any time where I felt I had lost control of Torrent. One of the more noble moments early on was finding a vortex for the first time and shooting way up into the sky to get a quick view of what was around me. Thankfully, the game is fairly generous for landing if you're trying to descend into one to avoid the fall damage. Because fall damage in Elden Ring can be a bit iffy. There were a number of cases throughout Elden Ring where I'd be like, can I survive this fall? More often than not, these seem to be the case. However, there were a few cases where I think falling I'd be fine, only to end up dead. Now when these situations happened, I didn't get pissed or anything, just mostly amused with a good laugh. So in speaking of deaths, let's shift gears and get into the meat and potatoes about combat in Elden Ring. Combat in Elden Ring continues in the vein of the Souls games, with a few new tweaks and additions. The addition of jumping makes for some notable shifts to how you can approach combat. Sure, there was a jumping attack in prior titles, but here you have much more freedom in how you approach with them. With those old Souls habits, I did spend a good portion of the early game sticking to R1 attacks and rolling. This still works well. However, looking back at some of the footage, present me is yelling at past me to make use of jumping attacks, especially the jumping R2 attack. It makes staggering enemies that much easier in Elden Ring. It hits quickly and does plenty of damage. Well, not as much damage as a charged R2, there's far less risk involved in using it. One missed opportunity in Elden Ring could have been having more enemy attacks that couldn't be dodged by rolling, but you could with jumping. 
For example, something like shockwave attacks. However, this would have had to be made crystal clear and very early on in the game. Not a deal breaker by any stretch, but feels more like a missed opportunity in regards to enemy pattern recognition, where you didn't just spam roll the entire time. If you're in the open world or during certain boss fights, you can make use of torrent for horseback combat. And while it doesn't offer as much choice in how you approach combat, such as using Ashes of War, I still enjoyed horseback combat. It's a great way to make use of heavy gear. Since you're not going to be rolling, might as well get as much protection as possible and not really worry about that penalty you get. It does take a bit to get used to, and depending on your weapon, it will take time to adjust your swings. There's quite a bit of fun to be had here. You can always hop off torrent if need be. They help make some fights more epic in scale. One early highlight for me was dealing with the dragon just east of where you start. Having access to a double jump can be handy in regards to dodging. One large issue I have with Torrent is if he takes too much damage, you'll need to use a flask to bring him back. However, the game asks you, are you sure, instead of just using the flask. It's an additional layer that's not needed. There were a number of times where I had close calls, or even deaths, due to the game asking me this. There's no need to ask. On the weapon front, there's plenty of weapons at our disposal to find throughout the lands between. Now, it can be fairly common to find one and stick with it throughout your playthrough. There's plenty of weapons you could find early that could serve you well to the very end. For example, the Bloodhound's Fang. I did try a number of weapons throughout my playthrough. I didn't do too much with shields, and that's how I've tended to play these games. I also didn't really play around much with dual wielding. I've always tended to stick with two-handing a weapon. Spells I made use of here and there. Some of the dragon incantations that you could acquire with dragon hearts stay in my arsenal for good portions of the game. And I'll admit, for a stretch mid game, I was making use of that frost axe. It was lightweight, and I love frost damage. Of course, it's also attached to that overpowered ashes of war prior to first patch. But more on that later. In the end, I mostly settled with unique weapons, the ones that required somber smithing stones to upgrade, the exception of a twin blade, which leads to one of the more notable flaws in Elden Ring, and that being the upgrade system. Weapons that require somber stones can be upgraded to plus 10. Each level upgrade requires just one stone. You can upgrade a regular weapon up to 25. However, you require way more stones than somber stones here. For each tier of the 10 smithing stones, save for the final one, you need to have 12 stones in total for each tier. Two to begin with, then four, then six. Now the first patch did fix this up. Cost of smithing stones was reduced to about a quarter to purchase, which just shows how off they were to begin with. Still, in the early game, it could take quite a bit of time to find the smithing stones you need until you have access to purchasing them. It could be common to have a five smithing stone when you're looking for threes. Compare that to the somber smithing stone, where you just need one for each level to upgrade. Why couldn't I just give the bearings to the smith in the round table hold so I didn't have to go back and forth once I could buy smithing stones? At least with the other blacksmith, I could buy somber smithing stones from him and upgrade right there. It was frustrating at times to go back and forth when upgrading my gear at the round table hold. I found this system pushed me more to make use of unique weapons, and less with regular weapons, which does lead to some of the issues with the Ashes of War mechanic. The Ashes of War is an extension of the weapons art system, and there was a lot of fun trying out these to see which ones I would come to enjoy. Most are focused on the offensive, although there are a few that will boost your stats or provide defense. What's great about the Ashes of War system is you could duplicate an Ash of War and apply it to another weapon, provided that's a standard weapon. Some Ashes can be used across all standard weapons. Others can only be used by certain types of weapons. While you can duplicate Ashes of War from unique weapons, you can't switch the Ashes of War with unique weapons. What you get with them is what you have to stick with. Wet Blades can be found throughout the lands between to change damage types of standard weapons. You could change out scales, the elemental attacks, blood, poison, frost. There are plenty of options here and it's all great stuff. However, these issues do arise and they are tied to the upgrade system. While you can duplicate ashes from unique weapons, you can't swap the unique weapons ashes of war, which I can agree with to an extent. Although I would have loved to have at least a few options to change the ashes of war for unique weapons. It didn't have to be to the extent for normal weapons, but it would have been welcome. The reason why is the game just pushed me more towards these somber weapons just the way they could be upgraded. Although I guess there can be a bit of a trade-off, the pros and cons of using a unique weapon over a standard weapon. Still, at least having a few options to swap would have been welcome here. I have to note that there is a lot of satisfaction of certain ashes when it came to the remembrance weapons. For example, getting to use that shockwave attack that Radigan used against you if you got Merica's hammer. While they did get nerfed early on, I have to make note of two noble ashes of war would allow for great levels of cheese. 
Firstly is the Horfrost Stomp. Damn, was this thing overpowered at first. A low cost to use, it did great AoE damage with potential for Frost, and it came out quickly. As mentioned earlier, I did make use of the Frost Axe that came with this Ashes of War for a decent portion of the middle game. However, I did realize I get a bit too reliant on the stop when I get lazier during the end of longer play sessions where I want to rush through things more. I used it more of a, in case of emergency, break glass to cheese from that point on. Before it got nerfed, of course. And another overpowered Ashes of War that got nerfed was the Night in Flame Stance. When I first discovered this one, I thought to myself, did anyone playtest this prior to launch? It was hilarious at first how quickly it could take stuff down. It became another one of those, in case of emergency, break glass to cheese. There was something that I came across that was getting really frustrating. So overall, I really love the Ashes of War system. I just wish there was a bit more choice in regards to swapping with unique weapons. One other nice addition is the Physic Flasks. They can only be used once per rest, but you have a number of choices here. You can mix them with two Crystal Tears. There are a number of different tiers to be found throughout Elden Ring. Boost your stamina, eliminate losing runes on death, boost different attack types. There are plenty to mix and match. In some cases, exploring unknown territory would have me ensuring I wasn't going to lose runes. I might switch it up against bosses, like negating damage or increasing the chance to break enemy stances. I did notice quite often when being summoned in for co-op, many were not making use of them. Hey, I'm all for taking advantage of what's offered to me. It's to get frustrated against the fight with Moog if I was summoned in, as many times the host would be killed by his one blood attack. Because there is a physic out in the world to deal with it, which I found rather lame. Plus, it wasn't located anywhere near him. If you do take him down fast enough, you can avoid it. It just felt a bit odd that they did something like that. Another addition are the rune arcs and the great runes, an extension of the humanity and ember system from the past titles of souls. Rune arcs can be collected throughout the world, bought, and also through multiplayer, whether the co-op or competitive. The great runes can be found at divine towers. Some of these are straight shots to collect the great rune. Others pose a few more challenges. One highlight being the inverted divine tower. Stupid invader aside. Oh, and fuck the one in Kaled with its precise platforming. Jumping is fine in Elden Ring, but precise jumping is not. With that, we could choose what kind of great rune we want to combine with our rune arc. Granted, most of the game I made use of Godric's great rune. I mean, you can't really go wrong with raising all your attributes. You have a number available as you get further into the game, and some might work better in certain situations. And if you die, you do lose these boosts unless you use another rune arc. It's a reasonable addition, although I found venturing through some of these divine towers weren't worth the trouble to get these great runes. At the end of the day, I rarely ventured away from Godric's great rune. Tis a bell for calling forth spirits. Summon them with it. From ash and return to the Erd Tree, the spirits will obey thine command but briefly, as they recall battles past. One new addition to Elden Ring are the Spirit Ashens. These can be summoned in at various points such as bosses or areas with plenty of enemies. You can't just use them anywhere. If you do summon a Spirit Ash, you won't be able to summon in a human co-op partner. My goodness, there's quite a number to choose from in regards to Spirit Ashes. Of course, you have to venture out to find them. There was a lot of fun getting a new one and summoning them and see how they did in battle. Some are up close and personal, others will fight from a distance. Some will be just one, others will be in a group. Some will be slower, others will attack at a constant rate. They can be upgraded as well through glove warts. This is done through spirit tuning. I'm sorry, let's try that again. I see. You're here for some spirit tuning. Thanks, Rodrika. You can find that rhythm of going back and forth with them. You draw an enemy's attention, and then a spirit ash will draw away their attention. Keep going back and forth with aggro. I did use my two skelly bros for a good stretch of the early game. These five shield bros served well later on. Some work better than others in various situations. In the many, many fights I had with Melania, Blood of Mikola, there was a lot of fun seeing how various ashes would perform against her. Some did shockingly well, like the Azula Beastman or the Man Serpent. Some, like the Avenant Soldier Ashes, those two pesky little guards gargoyle-like creatures did poorly against her, but did amazing in other areas. Of course, there's also the Mimic tier, the one that creates a Mimic of you. The one in which you find you more or less stop using other Spirit Ashes that you've come across unless you force yourself to. It was so powerful at first that they really had to nerf it, and they did. There is something so amusing of summoning a copy of you. Things will really get out of hand now that there are two of you. Although at points I found the AI for the Mimic could be a bit spotty, more so than some of the other Spirit Ashes. But overall, it's a really fun addition to the formula, and I did feel that the game was bounced more with them in mind than not. And on that note of summons, let's talk about multiplayer.
Multiplayer has always been one of those standout features in the Souls series. There have been some tweaks to the system to make it more accessible to new players, with some mixed results. Although I'm sure future updates or DLC will make adjustments to it to make it more like the titles of old. Since I've mostly been a Sunbro in the past, let's start with co-op. Summoning pools have been added as well, a nice little feature to make being summoned or summoning a quicker process. For most of my co-op experiences, I was being summoned in as opposed to summoning, mostly for bosses. It's a nice way to collect experience, obtain some rune arcs, and revisit and enjoyable bosses. There's always something so amusing about being summoned in and talking with one another through gestures. And while Elden Ring could get me down at times with its difficulty, I'd be brought back up by the number of times I was told I was beautiful by other players. You're beautiful. In regards to being summoned as a hunter to deal with invaders, they were mostly amusing experiences. Over the course of my playthrough, I think I was summoned about a dozen times or so, so not a whole lot. What happened to the vast majority of them? One case would be I'd be summoned in, only for the host or the invader to be killed about three seconds later. Other times, I'd be summoned quite a distance away. A number of times when trying to find them, the host or the invader would be killed. Very rarely would I actually be involved in a fight. Granted, that's also tend to be my experiences with this multiplayer aspect in past titles with Hunters. I was like that one person in a group project that gets high marks, but didn't really contribute to anything. What about being the invader? I've never been big into the PvP elements of the Souls games, especially the duels. I don't really care much for the meta spam fests they typically turn into. So when I invade here, I love to get sneaky and make use of the systems available here. I'm the kind of invader who likes to pose as an object, wait, and pop out to surprise them. There were a few times where I'd pop in, only to be right next to them, against a group of three. So what I understand with the current system, and do correct me if I'm wrong, when you invade, it's never one-on-one -on -one here. You'll be summoned into a world where there's more than one person, so you're always at the disadvantage, which is different than past titles. Now, one thing that I do expect to pop up in either a future update or DLC is that Coliseum that you can't access in Limgrave as of writing. This looks to be a PvP location where duels can take place, although I'm guessing that's mostly just going to turn into Rivers of Blood spam fest. On the notes of the Rivers of Blood katana, I actually missed it on my playthrough. If you defeat the fire giant prior to visiting the church as I did, the invader will not appear who drops it afterwards. Before moving on from multiplayer, I want to briefly touch on the message system. So okay, it was cute to see try jumping off a cliff, dog ahead, or hidden path the first time, but the next million times I saw it, it's like, guys, come on, try something original. Granted, when you have a system like this, leave it to the internet to run these jokes into the ground. Although any jokes around head or butt still made me chuckle at the right point. I did enjoy the messages mentioning Snake Eater in the Mount Gelmir area by the long ladder climb. What a thrill. Or tossing the Elden Ring in the fire. And of course, oh, you don't have the right. How this one came up, I don't know. But again, any kind of community is going to run these jokes into the ground. But that's always been the case for these kind of games. Now that we've covered most of the gameplay elements, let's piece it all together with our journey to the Erd Tree and becoming Elden Lord. Looking back through my time in Elden Ring, I had to give a fair amount of thought to find major issues I had with everything up to the Lindell Capital the first time around. Not that there weren't any parts that had issues, but it's more that the game afterward takes a bit of a dip in quality where most of the game's flaws pop up. Let's start with Limgrave. What an incredible starting area. Mentioned earlier, some highlights during my playthrough happened here, like the first dragon fight and getting warped over to Caelid. Other notable moments include meeting Melina and Ronnie. It's funny that it seemed like Melina was going to be a larger presence in the game after seeing those previews. However, besides popping up at the end, you could find her at Churches of America. There is more to her than meets the eye, but we'll get to that in a bit. We also meet Ronnie in Limgrave. As far as characters go in Elden Ring, she's one of the game's highlights and someone the community has really taken to. It doesn't hurt she has a long quest line that's one of the best in the game. Heading over to Stormvale Castle, we'll come across our first major wake-up call along the critical path for the boss fight against Margit. Sure, for me, it's been a couple of years since I last played a Souls game, but he still did me in, and the discussions I saw around him seemed to echo that sentiment. But as Elden Ring is an open world, I left to go explore, get better gear, and level up. 
Of course, now I could probably do this fight in my sleep, especially watching back the footage. Come on, Boulder, where's the use of Jumping Guard 2 to stagger him? Facing him later in the game as Morgoth led to far less tries. At that point, I had a much better understanding of how Elden Ring plays differently from past Souls titles. He really is a fantastic fight. He does have some of those delayed strikes. That's something that FromSoft has gone a bit too reliant on the series starting around Dark Souls 3. I feel it didn't really take away too much from the fight. He's a stop in the road, telling you to head out and wander before returning. Clear out more of Lingrave. Head up north to the lakes and explore what's around there. Head east to Kaled if you like to live dangerously or even find your way underground. Once I did return to him a few hours later, I think it was about a couple of tries was all it took that time around. Godric, who waits for us at the end of Stormvale Castle, only required one try against him. Hey, Godric's nothing more than a jumped up country bumpkin. Lord, oh, don't make me laugh. Stormvale Castle is one of the legacy dungeons in Elden Ring, akin to levels in the other titles. And what a dungeon it is. The sheer size, how it's interconnected with its shortcuts that we open up, the verticality that plays well with jumping, excellent enemy placement. This is not just a game highlight, but one of the highlights of the series. The birds with the weapons attached to their talons are quite terrifying. Things of course will be challenging, but if you take your time and explore, you'll make your way through. I was concerned that the rest of the legacy dungeons wouldn't live up to Stormvale Castle. However, I didn't really find that to be the case. Heading to the lakes up north is another fantastic area to explore. I think here more than any other I would just stop to take the beauty of the world in here. There was great relief in finding the smith out here by the manor where I could buy some somber smithing stones. Well, look at you. We don't receive many visitors. The manor here is one of the more notable enemies in Elden Ring that I know some hate with a passion. That being the hands, they immediately made me think of Thing from the Adams family. Although I didn't really struggle with them compared to some other enemies in the game. They fall quite easily to fire. Exploring this area will eventually lead us to Ronnie, which sets off a very long quest line. One that's completely optional but contains some of the best moments in Elden Ring. The Academy of Rhea Lucaria is another excellent legacy dungeon. It's less around the idea of opening up shortcuts around one central bonfire, but there's still plenty to explore here and it's all great stuff. Plus, if you gather info from a certain NPC, you can make use of an enemy to warp way up north of the map. It wasn't quite the same as getting warped out east, as I wasn't expecting that, but this was another one of those memorable moments in Elden Ring, ending up in a very faraway land. Speaking of ending up in faraway places, finding those teleporters throughout the lands between, there is always that wonder. What's going to be on the other side? It was nice for one of them to take us back to the very beginning area of the game to get revenge on that boss. Renala, the boss waiting for us at the end of Rhea Lucaria, is an excellent fight. One of those fights I didn't find overly difficult. It's much more of a spectacle fight. Hush, little Calva. I'll soon birth thee anew, a sweeting, fresh and pure. It's a two-parter fight that plays as a better version of the Deacons of the Deep fight from Dark Souls 3. The second part dealing with her directly and the arena change really makes this a memorable fight. Sometimes the series gets a bit too reliant on boss difficulty to make a memorable fight. But here, along with another one I'll cover shortly, is more the sums being greater than the parts. The music, the pacing, the scenery. Now, I enter Kaled willingly. He managed to nail that feeling of making it somewhere you don't want to be, but not making it too frustrating. I was all ready for it to be that level, that wasn't the case. Sure, some of the enemies here can really start to push you in if you're not careful, but it's a good kind of challenge. It was nice to return to those places I was warped to earlier to clear out with Greater East. Of course, the most notable portion of Kaled is the fight with Radon. This fight has a bit of a mixed reception. I did go back and forth for a while with my thoughts on this fight. Looking back on it all this time later, it really is a memorable fight, even with some lingering flaws. I love Radon as a character. There's something so heartwarming about how he learned gravity magic just so he wouldn't hurt his loyal horse. The build up to it is really incredible. I was curious to why there was so much open space on the map prior to, and then it clicked why this was the case. This is where we're going to fight him. Now he gathers the corpses of former friends and foes alike, gorging on them like a dog. Howling at the sky.
Getting to talk to other NPCs prior to fighting him really builds up that anticipation that this is a momentous event. And if you choose to summon them in for the fight, it feels like a boss out of a dungeon raid from an MMO. And I proceed to get my ass handed to me many, many times. Now, some of this was due to me just not walking away earlier to come back after upgrading some gear, getting more levels, exploring other areas. After all these years of Souls games, it's so calm to get into that rhythm of don't worry, I'll get him the next try. I mean, we've all been there. Of course, now the major difference being that this is open world, we have much more that we could explore otherwise. The first time I got into the fight, it was thrilling to reach him as he's a great distance away firing his bow with pinpoint accuracy. However, that did get old fairly quick after each try afterwards. If you cut this bit out, I feel the fight would have been much better. And sure, he may be a bit combo heavy with his moves, but he is one powerful demigod. And that point where he disappears, the music stops. That moment of flying in like a comet, it's one of the best moments in the series. So they did nerf for Dawn for a time with the first patch, before another patch returned him back to normal. You wanna know how badly they nerfed him? Well, I didn't get to experience this myself, but it took legendary gamer DSP just one try to beat him. And that's it. Wow, that is piss easy. Yo, that is piss easy. I, I, I will tell you guys right now, I 100% agree with you that that is terrible. Why did they nerf it like that? Sure, he was overleveled, using a guide, and having chat hold his hand throughout, but this is DSP we're talking about here. I wonder how he would have handled him without the nerf. With the death of Radon, more of the underground section opens up to us. So let's talk more about the underground sections of Elden Ring. There's an incredible amount down here to explore, and some of the game's highlights happen here, and all of it is optional. Ronnie's long quest line will take you to a number of areas in the underground. The stunning visuals, the haunting ambient music, all the questions flying in my mind of what happened down here. Something we pieced together throughout our travels. Torrent can be used in good portions of the underground here to explore, and beyond a couple of annoying enemies, like those archers who could hit you with pinpoint accuracy from a mile away, it's all great stuff. My favorite experience was discovering the Ancestor Spirit Boss. It's one of my favorite bosses, and it is one of the easier ones. It's more the case of the sum being greater than the parts. Although getting to that boss itself does take some time by lighting up all the torches. A whole batch of archers with pinpoint accuracy are going to try and stop you along your way. The fight takes place in a wide cave, and the game takes a step back from its usual bombastic boss music. On that note, to briefly touch on the music in Elden Ring, it's great. I did enjoy having ambient tracks that played throughout our travels. Now, some of the boss fights have music issues that have happened throughout the series, where everything is bombastic, full of choirs and violins, where everything starts to blend into one another. But this track here during the Ancestor Spirit fight takes a step back. It's probably my favorite track in the game. The fight itself is straightforward. It has a number of attacks, but it's not throwing them out at breakneck speed. It's very majestic in its movements, for better lack of a term, and I felt bad killing it. Moving on to Altus Plateau, so we're getting closer to the Erd Tree. I do like how you have a few options of getting here. Sure, you could collect the medallions to use the lift. However, you could also climb up your way here. Briefly back on the topic of music, there's those singing enemies with that beautiful haunting melody to draw you in, like a siren of Greek mythology. You could also get here through the academy with the abductor virgin to warp. However, this also leads to one of the more annoying gank bosses to get there. Luckily, the frost stomp cheese was available at that time. While this area feels like it doesn't have as much care put into it as the previous open world areas, it is still well constructed and has a lot of notable highlights. One of them, of course, being the windmill villages with all the dancing women. I do wish there was a gesture for this dance that they do. Unless I'm missing something, this doesn't appear to be the case. Please, FromSoft, can you add that in? Mount Gelmir in the northwest contains the Volcano Manor, one of the other legacy dungeons. You have the option to skip this dungeon altogether and doing a quest instead to get access to Rykard. That said, I did take the legacy dungeon approach, and it's another quality dungeon, even though it is a bit smaller in size compared to prior dungeons. The Rykard fight here is calling what's known in the community as a gimmick boss. We're given a specific weapon to take him down. Now, these fights can be a bit hit and miss in these series, but this fight hits the bullseye in regards to execution and presentation. Rykard pulling the sword out with that distinct voice of his is one of the more memorable cutscenes in the game. Join myself and King as 
remedy. Together we will devour the very god. It was around this time where I really started to explore more of the multiplayer elements in Elden Ring. I did this fight a number of times being summoned in as I had a great time with it. Plus, all the experience in rune arcs didn't hurt. Rykard hits hard, but they're well telegraphed once you know what's coming. Just prior to the Erdtree is Lindell, Royal Capital. And man, what an incredible dungeon this is. I was concerned with its sheer size that plenty of it wouldn't be accessible. That's something that past titles have had issues with. However, that's not the case here. I go back and forth if I like this area more than Stormvale. They're neck and neck with quality. There's so much to explore here. There's plenty of verticality, including some rooftop exploration. And capping it off is a great fight with Margot, now going as Morgoth. Pillagers, emboldened by the flame of ambition. Have it writ upon thy meager grave. Felled by King Morgoth. Last of all kings. And we're finally at the earth tree, but we can't go in. More needs to be done here. Now, had this not been the case, if we had the option to go in right now into the Elden Tree for the final battle, I wouldn't have minded. It still took plenty of time to get here and maintained a high bar of quality throughout. Well, mostly. There's the sewer section underneath the city. After getting lost in its tunnels and all those annoying enemies, I just pieced out. We still have to make our way through the mountaintop of the giants. And there's also the fair Missoula that we need to visit for the critical path. There's also large optional sections beyond the underground, the snowfield and the Halig tree. So despite how much content there was up to the royal capital, there's still plenty more. And this is where Elden Ring takes a noticeable stumble in quality. It can always be too much of a great thing, and that's something that Elden Ring suffers from. So I'm going to take a little segue here and talk briefly about another RPG that's considered one of the greatest ever made. Ah, the child of Ball has awoken. It is time for more experiments. Now, why am I bringing up Baldur's Gate 2? If you played it, you know just how much content this game has, especially Chapter 2 when you have to go collect a bunch of gold. There's tons of quests available for you, and if anything, too many. Years ago, I read a postmortem on the game from one of the founders of Bioware, and something from this postmortem always stuck with me. One thing mentioned was that they wished to cut down on how many quests they had, saying, One of the dangers of development is that game developers have a tendency to always add content if they are given time. They don't naturally spend time limiting and polishing content. Instead, more time means more stuff. I can't help but feel that FromSoft took this approach of adding in more content. Especially when it comes to the later sections, they took the approach of adding more instead of refining. Now, I will note there's over 20 years difference between these two titles. The industry is vastly different. Team sizes and budgets are way higher, along with the technology available. The design approaches that both games take are very different. Before we talk about the later areas, I want to touch on the repeating optional areas we can encounter. That being like the catacombs, the tunnels, the caves. I do think the game would benefit from having fewer of these, any kind of those optional areas, and flesh those out more. Because there are signs of good variety here. Some of the catacombs have different challenges to deal with. I wanted more of that. On the note of optional areas, I don't think I'd be ruffling many feathers if I suggested that Hero's Grave should have been greatly reduced or outright removed. Although I'm sure there's some sick puppy out there who enjoyed them. That first dragon fight out in the open world was fantastic, but those suffered from diminishing returns when they kept coming up. The only major thing really changing were the different types of damage they would do and larger HP bars. Same thing goes for the use of boss fights that get reused throughout the optional areas. That said, let's look at the later sections of Elden Ring. Now, I'm usually a big fan of snow levels. The Soul series has had some excellent ones. Mountain Tops of the Giants isn't one of them. It's not terrible or anything, but I didn't find much noteworthy on it, at least in regards to praise. It's around this point where Elden Ring really buffs up enemy HP and how much damage they deal out. If you haven't been putting your points into Vigor, you sure will want to be doing so now. Single combos are enough to take you down even with decent armor and reasonable levels of HP. I get it, we're getting near the end, so things are going to be more of a challenge. However, they went overboard here. Adventures away from challenging and more into frustrating. Signs are all there that these areas didn't get anywhere in the amount of tension as previous areas. 
Castle in the North, while optional, is a perfect example of this. One equation to quality level layout is enemy placement. One of the main criticisms of Dark Souls 2 is that enemy placement can be poorly thought out at points. Some of these aspects start to really flare up at the end of Elden Ring. It falls into that pattern of let's toss a bunch of enemies here without giving as much thought to the placement. These later parts also feature more enemies who love to do their multi-hit combos with next to zero cooldown in between. They even show up in a gank boss at the end here. Well, this is before the first patch, so enjoy the cheese, you sons of bitches. On a positive note of the mountaintop region, I did really enjoy the fire giant boss, although I've seen others not agree. I did feel it got the giant enemy boss concept right. He hits hard as he should, but he has lots of recognizable attack patterns that give you time to act. The fight also has a great transition to a second phase. Before continuing on the critical path of Fair Missoula, let's look at the other remaining optional areas. The snowfield didn't need to be in the game at all, just chop it all out. In one of the more puzzling reuses of bosses, they reused Estelle, a notable boss during Ronnie's quest line in the tunnel. A lot of that has to do around the lore of it. What's this one doing here? You know, since they love to reuse them in the later stretches, they might as well have just put another ulcerated tree spirit here. The other major optional area of note is the Holic Tree. This very much feels like it could have been a DLC in of itself, and perhaps it should have been, as there are some portions that feel like it needed more time. I don't have any major issues with the first portion of Descending Down. Things could be a bit tense with the narrow platforms, but it didn't veer too much into frustration territory. Major issues arise at the base of the tree. As I mentioned earlier, one important equation to level design in these titles is enemy placement. I do enjoy the layout here, but what really makes this part frustrating is that, for a better lack of a term, this area suffers from Dark Souls 2 enemy like placement. Let's simply make it difficult by throwing a ton of enemies together in small spaces. Sure, this is the greatest challenge the game has to offer, and is optional. However, it simply lacks the care that previous areas did when it came to enemy placement. The damage output and how much HP enemies tend to have here is mostly over the top. As well as some enemies here would have been better suited for the faster styles of Bloodborne with their unrelenting attacks. There was great relief in finding a Shrine of Grace further in, but in the sense it was, thank god I don't have to run through that area again. It came to the point of instead of fighting my way through, I take a few deaths to find a way to run through, hoping I wouldn't get hit and locate the next Shrine of Grace. Which is too bad because I really enjoyed the layout of the level. And of course, waiting for us at the roots is Melania. I am Melania, Blade of Mikola. And I have never known defeat. I really should have kept tally of how much I heard I am Melania, Blood of Mikola. Of all the bosses I've encountered in the Soul series, I don't think there's one that I both love and despise as much as Melania. She's an incredibly challenging fight. She was the one I died to the most of in all my time of playing the Souls games. There's much to enjoy here. The arena, the cutscene prior, the lore behind her, her appearance, the music, the shift to the second phase. Some of the best in the game and anything from Soft has done. She hits hard and fast, but she can be staggered fairly easily. She has a number of recognizable patterns. It very much feels like a dance in fighting her. Once you get that rhythm down, it's incredible. There is punishment for getting sloppy, as getting hit by her will heal some of her health. But then, there's her waterfowl dance. This is very much a great idea, not so great execution. I'm totally fine with having an attack like this that can more or less do you in just like that. However, if that is the case, the player should at least have a few options, like one being running away. The other being that you could take a risk and interrupt the attack, which could lead to critical damage against the boss. Now, we do have plenty of time to run away here. However, she moves an incredible distance with great speed. So if you dodge the first flurry, you still got two more to avoid. And it also ends with an AoE attack. This is something that FromSoft pulled from their bag of tricks a bit too often during the end game here. Now, I'm sure there's someone out there who knows when to roll at the right time with these strikes, but they really should have slowed them down so they're better tells on when you could roll. My attempt against her ended many times with this one move. There were countless times where I summoned in to help that ended when she used the attack on the host, where I can only sit and pray that they managed to survive. As far as interrupting her, well, someone discovered that you could use a freezing pot on her to interrupt. You know what should have had the ability to interrupt? Pretty much any form of damage you could do on her. 
lower her a bit more to the ground, so you could take a swipe at her to interrupt and open up for some critical damage, or if you're too late, suffer the consequences. And I understand she's supposed to be the toughest boss to deal with, but there are better ways of providing this challenge, and it's so close to being that way, which makes this fight so frustrating. For how much enjoyment I could get from this fight, it could be taketh away just like that. Back to the critical path, let's talk about Faramazula. While an excellent area and one of the many visual treats Elden Ring has to offer, it does suffer from some overbuffed enemies where at some points I didn't stay to fight, but just ran like hell and hoped I found somewhere safe or a Shrine of Grace. And in one of the worst moments of the game, there's the Godskin Duel. Well, at least you have the option to use the environment here to get in between them, and they are also weak to sleep. This fight very much feels like they took previous bosses, tossed them together, and called it a day. Ornstein Smo, they are not. You know, if you're not going to put the time into gank fights, just reuse one of them, or just put no bosses in there at all. And as far as the critical path goes for Elden Ring, bar none, this is the worst boss fight in my mind. While optional, the fight against the Dragonlord boss is one of the best in the game. It's a spectacle and great challenge. The moves hit hard, but patterns can be recognized, and there's enough time in between to get your hits in. The Dragonlord also has a large AoE attack that could do you in if you're not careful. However, they didn't make this mistake like the Melania fight and gave you plenty of time to get away from it. For whatever reason as well, the music fades away when he does this, giving an audio cue of what's to come. I did enjoy the Malekith fight, although I do know others found it to be a great pain. My big issue that I do have to note, however, especially with the second phase, is the over-reliance of AoE attacks after ending a combo. Now we can finally make our way into the Erd Tree, although a couple bosses stand in our way. One of them is Sir Gideon. Come on man, you're the all-knowing. You should know better of how powerful we must be at this point. Go back to your books, Junior. Where we fought Morgoth now stands Godfrey, the first Elven Lord. It's an enjoyable fight. The major point of note, of course, is how he turns into Senator Armstrong for the second phase. And after entering the Ur Tree, we come to see Merica only to fight Radigan. Radigan is the male half of Merica. Well, that's not 100% clear to me how this actually works. Were they always one? Did they become one later? Though I'm sure this is something maybe DLC will explore. This is a fantastic fight, one of the best in the series. It uses one of my favorite gaming tropes. The music that's used here is the song that plays when we boot up the game. There's no 15 hit combos here. Attacks are well telegraphed, although I do have to know it gets a bit too reliant on doing AoE attack damage at the end of combos. As I mentioned in the combat section, they could have really explored more about having certain attacks like shockwaves that could be rolled through but could be voided with jumping. I was expecting the second half of the fight here would be against Merica, but that's not the case. Instead, we end up against the Elden Beast. As a final fight, I have mixed feelings on it. The presentation, the music, fantastic. It gives off those majestic vibes like the ancestor spirit fight with how it moves. The music is much more low-key as well. There's plenty of tell with its attack patterns and there's plenty of time to do damage to the beast. The major issue being is the beast constantly moving great distances from us, which would be fine if we had access to torrent during this fight, but we don't. And I don't know why this was the case. Everything about the fight just screams horse boss, yet the option isn't given to us. With that, depending on what quests we did, we could have a few options for endings. So let's dive more into the lore and some of the quests of Elden Ring. If you played these games before, you know how the plot and lore gets unfolded throughout the game. The item descriptions, talking with NPCs, environmental storytelling. It's up to you to take all those pieces and put it together. Of course, you could also watch the countless lore videos on YouTube to get more insight. The way the story is told works well in the medium of video games. One meme that's popped up in the community is Zanzibart Forgive Me. So for context, this comes from a tweet that Dark Souls revolutionized games, in the sense that instead of a story now, you could just have some guy with a big sword named Myrmidon of Loss who gasps, Zanzibat, forgive me, when he dies. And then 20 YouTubers will make an hour long video about how deep your lore is. Now I have to admit, this is pretty funny and it is true with how the lore is here. What makes this really funny is who wrote this. The guy who wrote this is the lead writer for Tiny Tina's Wonderlands and did writing for Borderlands 3, titles that are well known for their stellar writing. And let me just give you an example to refresh your memory. And I, Tiny Tina, am the Bunker Master. So what I say goes! And I say there's a magical diamond buying a corn named Butt Stallion who saves the day! Oh, I was kind of hoping we would save the day? You will, Valley Girl. I just gotta set the stakes. Now, let's table talk. Cue Dragonlord!
Of course, the big difference this time around was that George R.R. Martin was brought in. Having another reason to procrastinate finishing The Winds of Winter, George was happy to oblige. The work he did here was on the backstory and lore. He said his work was akin to being a dungeon master for a tabletop role-playing game. So at first, I couldn't really see his fingerprints on Elden Ring. However, the more I played, the more it became apparent. The family dynamics, characters like the Dung Eater, the abundance of turtles. On that note, I love the turtle pope. How could you go wrong with a giant turtle wearing a pope hat? It doesn't hurt he's just so kind and helpful when you talk with him. He gets my vote for running the lands between. Another aspect that has George's fingerprints all over it is the similarity in names. Could we have gotten a little more name variation? Godfrey, Godwin, Godric, Gideon, Merica, Mikola, Melania, Melina, Millicent, Moog, Margaret, Morgoth, Ronnie, Relina, Radigan, Radon, Rikard. We need more distinct names like Kenneth or the Lonesome Dung Eater. Now a common complaint I've seen is that it can be hours in between seeing certain NPCs. This has always happened in the Soul series, but having the open world makes this a potential larger issue. It can be common for me to run into the game and be like, oh yeah, that's what you want by looking through my notes to get a reminder of what's going on with them. So when people wish there was a journal of some form to take note of in the game, I can see where they're coming from on this front. And like past titles, plenty of these NPC quests can have downer endings like they've tended to be, and completing a few of the more involved ones end up with different possible endings. Ronnie's long quest opens up hers. Looking at Steam achievements, this is the most popular choice for the ending. After all, she's been highly loved in the community, and this quest spans many hours, so it's like, might as well choose this one. And that's the one I end up choosing as well. Into fear, doubt, and loneliness. As the path stretches into darkness. Well then, shall we? So what's next on the horizon, not just for Elden Ring, but for FromSoft, open world titles, and the industry in general? In three weeks, Elden Ring sold 12 million copies. Bandai Namco is expecting Elden Ring to sell around 4 million copies in three months. They, no pun intended, shattered sales expectations. In a press release, FromSoft said to please look forward to more of Elden Ring as an IP in hopes of expanding beyond the realm of games. So what's that going to include? Novels? Manga? anime, live action HBO show. They do have those connections through George R.R. Martin. And speaking of George, maybe he'll pen a novel on the IP? Hey, anything to delay Winds of Winter even more. On the game front, what's next for Elden Ring? Knowing their history for DLC, lingering plot threads, and high sales, I expect we'll be hearing something in the coming months on DLC as of writing. In regards to plot threads, two major ones that would pop out to me would be Melina and Mikola. Or perhaps the DLC will take us beyond the lands between. Perhaps we'll get to explore the lands where America's from. However, that feels like something that would be more explored in a sequel. There is plenty of space here on the map that is covered by clouds. It does seem possible that some of these clouds will lift, and these could be possible DLC locations, but we'll have to wait and see on that front. For the past titles in the Soulsborne series, FromSoft needs to get the multiplayer aspects of the three Dark Souls titles on PC fixed pronto. As of writing, they've been down since January 2022 due to the security exploit. Seeing those sales numbers and how nearly half the sales were from PC, you're going to have an audience who haven't played those past titles, but would now be interested in exploring them. Of course, you could still purchase these and play them, but not having multiplayer accessible really takes away from the overall experience. So here's to hoping that they get fixed. And I myself might revisit them for future videos, so having multiplayer in would definitely help. Over the last couple of years, it seems like we got a new Bloodborne PC port rumor popping up on a monthly basis. And I hope we can finally put that to rest. If seeing those PC sales numbers of Elden Ring doesn't convince them to do a Bloodborne PC port, I don't know what will. Sony has begun to release former exclusives on PC. Bloodborne by far has the most interest and would do incredibly well for them. The same case as well goes for Demon Souls. Of course, currently you can make use of this through a PS3 emulator, but they also have the PS5 remake that could be ported over. And what about future titles made by FromSoft? Once you go open world, you don't exactly turn away from that. It's obvious a great deal of time was put into getting the open world elements to gel with the Soulsborne Foundation for Elden Ring. With that open world experience under their belt, I would like to see them focus more on combat innovations. Take what they learned from titles like Sekiro and expand on that. And what about the industry at whole? 
This is going to be fascinating to see. When you sell 12 million copies in three months, others are going to take notice of what you've done. I've seen some suggest that the next Zelda title got delayed until 2023 due to seeing how Elden Ring turned out, and now they need to make changes as necessary. Now I could see that to a point, but this game seems to be having a bit of a troubled development and needs more time. Judging by past decisions, I expect Western publishers and developers to try and capture some of the Elden Ring audience, but miss the mark with their typical shenanigans. One aspect that I wouldn't be surprised to see is trying to bring in big name authors to work on titles, or use them as a selling point. It's hard to say how much having George R. R. Martin attached to Elden Ring helped with sales, but it certainly helped. Hell, Bandai Namco has said that they want to work with author Brandon Sanderson on project, something that he would love to do. What gets me curious is those working on their open world titles. Will Elden Ring have an impact on their design decisions? Will they make adjustments to their open world formula so it's less hand-holding and more exploratory? Companies like Ubisoft have more or less used the same formula for over a decade at this point, so breaking these kind of design practices becomes hard patterns to break. I would hope for them to pull the exploration aspects of Elden Ring, but I'm not getting my hopes up too much. And don't be surprised that companies try and nickel and dime you or make it a live service title. What about on the indie front? The Soul series has had a noticeable impact on the indie scene. What can they pull from Elden Ring? Well, open world is tricky to do on a smaller scope and budget. However, if FromSoft moving forward is going to be sticking with open world, there is an opening available for Souls-like titles to be more focused on more linear experiences. This is something that smaller studios can capitalize on. The impacts that Elden Ring have on the industry may take a couple of years to play out, due to how game development time is. I won't be surprised to see a lot of Western studios try some things, they might get the surface details right, but miss what really makes the game work, along with typical customer-unfriendly practices we've seen from them. Of course, this could all be completely wrong. Open world titles from other studios continue with business as usual. I guess we'll have to see how this plays out. Wrapping everything up, how do I feel about Elden Ring overall? Well, let's go back to my ranking of the four Souls games that I've played. From best to worst, it's Dark Souls, Demon Souls, Dark Souls 3, and Dark Souls 2. Without hesitation, I prefer Elden Ring over Demon Souls, Dark Souls 3, and Dark Souls 2. And comparing it to Dark Souls, well, that one's a bit more tough. After all, that was my first experience with the series. And I will note that Dark Souls has a noticeable drop off in quality in the later areas. But that could also be said for many of my favorite games. So I'm going to take the coward's way out here and say I'm going to wait for all the DLC for Elden Ring to be released to make that decision of which one I prefer. As is, Elden Ring is a phenomenal title. FromSoft was able to integrate the soul style into the open world formula and bring about that sense of wonder and exploration that few games have been able to capture. And as amazing as it is, there are some noticeable flaws that do flare up. Every game has them, even the best ones around. But I find them really apparent in Elden Ring. It's my favorite release in I don't know how many years now. And even then, it could have been so much more. Now I do have to note in closing, I do hope for future titles FromSoft doesn't fall into some of the Dark Souls traps. By that I mean really leaning into some of the difficulty aspects where they would take shortcuts like tossing in more enemies to make things more difficult. Once you go open world, you can't exactly go back. Last thing I want them to do is to make the next title even larger and grand in scale. Main core of Elden Ring's flaws come from the sheer size of the game. They got the open world aspects right. I would like to see them take shifts to combat with what they did with Bloodborne and Sekiro. So I look forward to seeing the DLC of what is to come and what's in store from the future of this studio. Sounds about to forgive me.